Tracy, we're talking about you before you came in. Obviously, as a person, I really like you. But then we're fans of forever. What do you? What? What is your best song? What's your? What's the? Such a vague question. What's your best song? You know, uh, there's a lot of ways to look at that. I'd say personally, for me, I see it now is one of my favorite songs to sing. But "Time Marches On" is the best written song that I have. But "Paint Me in Birmingham" might have been the most impacting song that I had. Mm, all so, those are wrong. It's alibis. <laughs> In case you're wondering the answer, it's alibi. Um, no, all those are great songs. But Amy and I were talking because we were talking about you coming in, and we were playing some clips of stuff. And when that hook and alibis hits, oh, what a good record that was! Mm-hmm. And it just had such a great look to yes. it too. It just the, the movement of it was very special. You know, a lot of people don't realize that uh, Tracy Bird cut that on his debut record, and it got bumped from the album. He had been singing that song at the club. Uh, he was like it, playing at Cutters for years, and uh, they'd been playing that song in the club for a long time. And so his fans were mad at me because they thought I stole his song, the people that knew him from back home in Beaumont. So when that song came out, but they didn't hook it. I mean, we Stroud just cut a great record on that thing. Did you ever hear his version of it, like the no, studio version? I never heard it, but but he's actually got on stage and sang it with me a few times. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it's, it's cool. Back in the day, how did fans get mad at you if there wasn't social media to yell? Oh, they they just, uh, you know, they're very protective of their artists that they attach to, especially people that had been following him uh, when he was, before he got to Nashville, he cut that first record, that fans that were that went with him way back. But how would you know? Because they couldn't, like, send you a comment on Instagram. Oh, well, they you send hear you, like, about the, it, though. The, okay, oh, like yeah. the Paul Revere. Because back then I did meet and greets <laughs> every night. And people would say that to you? Oh, yeah. I can't believe you stole his song. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Um, okay, let's do Time Marches On then. You say best written song. I think that song is like a work of art. If you really look at the message of that song, it's it's talking about multiple generations of a family. To paint that picture and really get all of that imagery across in three and a half minutes, Bobby Braddock wrote that by himself. I mean, it's a masterful piece of work. Still kind of holds up. You know how sometimes yeah. you go watch a TV show and it doesn't hold up, or, or, or there'll be one from like the late 90s. You're like, man, this would still be good today. That song still kind of holds up and makes you feel the way you so. felt even back then as well. Without a doubt. Um, where does that go on your set list, Time Marches On? Uh, almost right at the end, right before Birmingham. They're my last two numbers. Man, if your voice is tired and you got to do that key change and pay me a Birmingham. You know, it's weird, though. I can I can have problems with other songs that are in lower keys. I never have a problem with Birmingham. You're going out doing the headline stuff now. You just finished some Riley Green shows, right? How was that? Awesome. Riley's great. And, and I didn't realize how massive his career is. He's drawing huge yeah. crowds right he's, now. He's killing it. He's killing it. How were his fans with you? Were they super? Were they awesome? They were great. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't have the abs he does. But, you know. <laughs> Your headline tour is TracyLawrence.com. If you guys want to get tickets tonight, you're in Louisville. Um, what do you start the show with? Uh, there's a song uh, called Made in America that I wrote a few years ago that I'm kind of kicking things off with. I like to kind of set the tone for... You know, just what I feel about this country and, and just kind of get everybody excited about what the night holds. I don't do a whole lot of patriotic stuff, but I like to start my show with it. Out here in it is the new EP that's out now. Yes. And so you have six songs on this. You know, when you make new music and you've had so many massive songs, you're kind of competing with yourself. And I think about that when I'm going into cut stuff. I look for things that I can plug into the show that are a little bit different, that don't stay on top of things I already have. Because the hardest thing about, uh, you know, when you're not really working radio like what we used to do back in the 90s when you're just using social media to, to prop a song up is, is feeling how well it impacts. Some things do impact still. Uh, so I'm moving things through my set list all the time. So I try to been, put them in spots where they don't kind of step on anything else that I have. But I do think about all that stuff when I cut a new record. When you make a set list, do you think about, I don't need to put two slow songs back to back because then the crowd will fall asleep? It depends on what those songs are. Some songs, can you can put anything around them and they'll hold up uh, any time. But I don't like to do too many new songs back to back. I like to scatter them through so I can just, a lot of times I won't even tell the crowd they're a new song. I just kind of play them and let them pass and then move on to something else. I, but I don't like to leave them laying around. I would not, I would not go in and do three songs off a new project that nobody knows. I wouldn't do all those back to back. Yeah, good for you for caring about the, the fans because I've been to shows with major acts and when they played like three or four new ones, and listen, I understand as a creator, we want to do the new stuff we've done as well. Without a doubt. However, people have paid good money to come and hear the songs they love as well. Yes. And I, I've told this story. I went to a concert once, one of my favorite bands. They never played a hit. They played their entire new record and I was like, I feel gypped. And I, and I look at that from the fans' perspective, too. I don't want to be that artist. 
Uh, and I'm blessed that I always had creative control over the things that I cut. So I don't feel like I have to go back and say, God, I wish I hadn't cut that song. No My real stories will, about the record label making you cut songs? The only song that, that uh, and I had to negotiate for it. I didn't really love Texas Tornado. Oh, I know, man, and I it's love crazy that one. now. Oh. But, but I didn't really love it. Uh, but I negotiated a deal with Rick Blackburn at the time. I said, I'll cut Texas Tornado, but I wanted to start producing my own stuff. I said, if if uh, if this works out well, so it it opened the door for me to do Renegades, Rebels, and Rogues, which opened the door on the next project for me to do co-production stuff on my record, which kind of got me in the studio more. Hey, Mr. Savvy, Mr. Shark Tank over here making <laughs> deals ahead of time. got to leverage when you can, baby. Yeah, no, you're right. Uh, your hometown, uh, do you consider Foreman, Arkansas, your hometown? I do. Uh, tell everybody what Foreman's like. If they were to drive into Foreman. <laughs> well, look, living in Arkansas, you know, there's not a lot there. Foreman, when I grew up there, it was there was 1,100 people on the census. We uh, used to play Foreman in sports. Did you really? Like, from Mountain Pine, we had 700 people, and yeah. so equal size, very small towns. But I, I'm, I know Foreman well. So what was – you drive in, is there – you don't have a Walmart, do you? Oh no, we have yeah. we we do have a Dollar General now. We do have a Dollar General too. But we don't even have a we don't have any even have a red light. We have a four way stop. We have so the same no red light and a four way stop. We're the same. Nothing. There's nothing there. What was Foreman like for you as a kid? You know, uh, it was great. It was great growing up in a small town. Uh, we were the Foreman Alligators, so our mascot was the Gator. So we had this little cafe called the Gator Inn. And you would uh, when you went downtown on the weekends, everybody'd meet at the Gator Inn and say, "Where are we gonna gather up tonight?" So we had. Three gravel pits. We had the rice field. We had the Catholic cemetery. So we'd go to these places and build a fire and just kind of hang out and do our thing. So we always picked a different place every every weekend where everybody would go hang out. But there was really nothing else to do. Bad enough, we we all started drinking very early. I mean, well, that, there's that nothing else to the, do. That's part of the else. culture. It is. And people that come from big cities that I know now that always lived around a big city, they don't understand going to a field. No. It's because that's all there was. There's nothing else to was do. Was going to a field. And we didn't have enough money to ride around all night. I mean, because that was gas. That was gas money. I mean, I, I might get $5 a weekend. Of course, $5 lasted a lot longer back then, too. What kind of jobs you had back then? Uh, I worked pretty much all through high school at a construction company. Um, and so when we didn't have jobs going on, I'd mow the yards uh, of the owner, mow the owner's yard, or, or take up, keep up stuff at the shop. But we did everything. I mean, remodel houses, work, uh, uh, you know, commercial projects and different things, build houses and stuff. So I worked there for like four years all the way through. Could you build there. a house right now? I don't think I could. Oh. <laughs> I can I can do little projects, but I don't. You know, there's a lot about that stuff that I don't really want to do. What's your specialty? <laughs> as far as uh, non music. Specialty. My non-music specialty. I like doing woodwork. Uh, I've done a little welding. I've done a little bit of electrical work. What kind of welding? Did you do like TIG welding or did you do like... MIG welding stuff, just oh, wire man. welding and stuff. I, I burn myself a lot. Yeah, but I haven't done it in so long. You really got to step on top of that stuff to run true beads. I mean, that's, that's, it'd be, it, I'd have to practice to get my skill set back. It's been a long time. You fish much? Uh, I do. I, I actually fished just a few weeks ago. Uh, I just got back off a snapper trip. My face is a little burnt right now. It looks good. Got yeah. a little color. I got a little color on my face. Yeah, but yeah, my but, nose yeah. was peeling. My nose is peeling. How about a tan good. on your body? What do you got? You got, you got like a. I got a dad tan. I try to keep these shirts on most of the time. These <laughs> the days. long sleeve, so it yeah, doesn't do that. I, absolutely. Yeah, I don't want to get burnt. My face got a little bit too much. When you put this record out, this this EP that came out, and there are six songs. Like, how many songs do you go through and select of the six? Like, do you have twelve, thirteen, or do you just find the best six and go in and cut them? My, my system is different now than what it used to be. I used to spend months and months. I would go through thousands of songs looking for stuff and then write a lot and try to come. I had a cull process where I would be making mixtapes and, and cull things down and see what I burned out on and I would remove it. This time, I mean, I, I found really good songs early on, I, but, but I have such a great well of writers. And I know a lot of the younger writers too. I cut one of Ernest's songs. But I got to the point that I was, I'd, I'd found my first song is uh, I Could Use One. That was one of the first demos. I mean, I think it literally was the first thing that I played that I got in. I'm like, this is going to be easy. It was great. And then, then I kind of hit a dull spot. And so I, I called Bobby Pinson and I called Ernest and I called people that I knew and said, send me the best song that you got that you think will be for me. And that was basically what I did. So that the, the project came out in June about a month or so ago. Mm -hmm. Have you, and you've played some of these. Do you once you go out and play them for the first time, does it kind of reset you on which songs? Oh wow, I think people like this one the best because you can actually play them in front of people. Yeah, but it's so hard. Uh, you know, sometimes a really good deep lyric that you really have to listen to a few times. It 
it's hard to gauge what people feel about it when they just hear it in passing for the first time. Sometimes songs, you need to sit with them for a little bit. A good party song that you can get the crowd rolling, those are all great, but sometimes they don't impact the same. Uh, so it's really hard for me to gauge. Uh, but I, what I, we, I think we were dropping a single every six weeks through this process, so I would plug the new one in into the slot in my section because I only got 45 minutes with Riley, so I didn't have a lot of time to play around. So I did a couple of medleys of, of songs in my set, and then I had one spot that I would plug the new one in as we were going through the release process of everything that we're doing. And then I, I really don't know how to gauge that with the crowd. We just kind of have to take feedback that we get from socials and kind of feel what people like. When did you feel like you were good at singing? Was it in church and getting the uh, feedback from – but again, I would sing in church. And I was terrible, so I was also getting the positive feedback. But I knew I couldn't be a singer. Yeah. But you, a lot of church playing and singing, right? Uh, yeah, early, early on, yeah. I, I didn't really like uh, church music that much. It it didn't land in the right key for me. There were things about church music that the literal key, like the, like, the singing got key. It, got it. It, was, it was oftentimes it was a little painful, so I would just do it in, in a lower register or something. But it was never something that I cared about. Now, when I was in kindergarten, I remember this in my little kindergarten class. I remember for the holidays they had the teacher had done four or five boards, and and she broke the class up into little groups where there were four or five in each one, and we were, we had the parents come in for Parents' Day, and we were singing holiday songs and all this. Well, they put me on every board in kindergarten. Baller. And and so I knew I, I could I could hear pitch and I could sing in tune when I was very young. But about twelve or thirteen, I mean I really started getting into Merle Haggard and George Strait was just coming out. So that was really when I started connecting with it on a true level where I really started saying, I think I might want to do this for a living. This might be what I want out of life. Could your parents sing or they play instruments? No, I didn't grow up in that kind of family. I mean, uh, really there was not a lot of music in, in our house. Daddy never even listened to the radio in the car. I mean, it just it it was just something that was inside of me. How does a guy from Foreman, Arkansas, ever think he can make it as a national recording artist? I have no idea because everybody thought I was absolutely insane, and I didn't know. I mean, nobody nobody gets out of Foreman, Arkansas. I mean, especially back then, you don't even know what exists in the world. I. Uh, I I just dreamed it. I wanted it so bad. What did you see that made you dream it? Like, what was it where you're like, I want that? Like, was it you're watching TNN? Was it your, you know, what was it? Just the radio? Yeah, the radio. And and uh, when I learned to play a few chords on the guitar, the girls liked the way mm -hmm. I sounded. Mm -hmm. You know, that always has a lot to do with it. I just, I just wanted it so bad. It, it just seemed to give me an identity. Uh, I wasn't a great athlete. I played a little baseball in high school, but I wasn't very big, so I, I couldn't take the hits in football. Uh, and and so it, it gave me something that was different than everybody else had. When you moved to town, who were your musical heroes at that age when you moved to Nashville? You got them tattooed on you? George Strait, George Jones, Keith Whitley, Merle Haggard. And how many of them did you get to spend time with? Every one of them but Keith. Keith died the year before I came to town. So, like, did you get to know Lori at all? Oh, yeah. Lori and I are very close. And and her kids. Lori Morgan, by the way. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. So, kind, you know, as close as you could have. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and Keith was a big inspiration for me. But I, I spent the most time with Jones. Uh, I awesome. was a bigger Haggard fan than I was with Jones. But Jones was the first tour that I was on at 92 when I went out with Jones for a couple of years. And I got very close to George. Um, was I, he crazy? Was he wild and crazy then, or was it, has it cal calmed down? If, no, when? he wasn't. Uh, George, kind of, you know, uh, when when I was around him, I think he still took a nip every now and then. But George wasn't drinking the way that he used to. He had kind of got it all under control. And Nancy had kind of put the, the the tight grip on him a little bit. But I mean, he was a sweet old grandfather to me. I spent a lot of time with George. One of my favorite memories. It was about three years before George passed, and uh, uh, we had gone to Fireside the studio. I don't. I think Fireside's gone now. But Nancy had put some uh, charity project together, and she wanted me and George to do a duet together. And I'd gone in and done my part of the song, and George was there, and he came in, and, and George was having trouble. He couldn't see. He couldn't see the lyric, and he couldn't hear the pitch anymore. And he asked me to come in the booth with him, and I, and I would sing the line for him and help him go through the whole thing. And, and I look back at that as such a fond thing because I got to share something very special with Jones at a time when he was frail and he was struggling that I don't think anybody else got a chance to do. I got to do something with him that nobody ever got to do. And the fact that he would be vulnerable enough to trust you? Absolutely. Because he could have asked anybody to do oh, that. Yeah. 
It was very special for me. Yeah, that's really cool. You know what was the jam that I feel like sometimes isn't brought up when it's like, this song was great. The old, the older George Jones, I don't need your rocking chair. Oh, yeah. Your Geritol or your Medicare. I still got neon in my veins. Dang, that song was awesome. It was awesome. And you got to think, too, jo- and, and it, this inspires me a lot as I've had the ups and downs in my career. You know, George, at that time in the early 90s when everything was taken off, the young country movement was hitting. Radio stations were changing formats. You had, in 89, you had, you know, Garth and Chestnut and Alan Jackson and Travis Tritt and Vince Gill, and you had that whole barrage, and it was new. Everything was changing. I came to town right after that. And so you had all these guys like Waylon and and uh, Merle and all that. They were angry that all of a sudden they had been on the charts for 30 or 40 years, and now they weren't getting the records played, and they were mad, and they were mad at us. I mean, they blamed all of us for it. And uh, I saw George take a different perspective. I saw George cut rock and chair, and I saw him take me on tour and Mark Chestnut on tour, and I, I got to spend time with him, and he looked at it from a completely different perspective, and he had a whole other career at that time that none of the rest of them really did, and it made me realize that sometimes you just got to get out of your own way and realize that things change. Uh, you can either grab a hold and be a part of it, or you can just get out of the way. And what's amazing about what you just said, and it's not exactly the same because George was older, than you are now, but you're talking about Ernest and these guys. Absolutely. You're doing the same thing. Absolutely. The podcast and the things that I do to build relationships with all of these younger artists, I'm putting myself in a situation where I can I can have relationships with this generation of artists that I wouldn't have any other way. And I treasure it. I love it. I made a lot of friends that way. I'm not put off by it, and I'm not jealous of it. I'm proud for their success. And they're having success that we never had. I mean, it's amazing how big our format is now. Uh, I'm going to show you a picture here. This is you and a very, very, very young Jason Aldean. Oh, yeah. What the heck is this picture? He looks 12. Do You I, I, You probably don't remember the pic taking I don't. it. But, I mean, what what was this even doing? Do you know what, what he was doing? I know I know he was a huge fan of mine. He's told is me that. Is it a meet that, and greet? Probably. That's crazy. And he's told me uh, that uh, he had my poster on his wall when he was in high school. I was like, <laughs> dude, I had Farrah Fawcett on my wall. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what was wrong with you. <laughs> Here's a picture of you and George we, that it pulled oh, off. Yeah. What, what is, do you know what, when this was? Because it, it could have been at any point. You know, that was... That jacket right there is from the tour because it's got the Red Man tobacco logo on it. So that would have been 92, somewhere. And I used to give him, excuse me, hell about that jacket. He always wore those jackets with that fringe on them. And I love to give him a hard time <laughs> about his wardrobe selections. <laughs> so, everybody, go to a Tracy show, TracyLawrence.com. And he's got, I mean, I have your whole tour schedule. You're on the road doing a bunch of shows. Yeah, we work a lot. Yeah, I, yes, and I know you work a lot. Like, yeah, do you enjoy it? Do you like? I do. I, I've learned over the years. I, I've taken a lot more time off this year than I have in the past. I mean, I, I took a, several weeks. So I mean, I'll, I'll try to take a week off every month or six weeks. I don't, and I don't do go, what? Uh, go to the beach house. Go on vacation with the fans. We've been. We. I mean, with my wife. With the fans. Fans, with the fans. That's go a party vacation. right there. Oh, let's go. <laughs> yeah, let's not do that. Uh, but we, <laughs> I've, I've tr- started traveling more. I mean, we've we've taken a couple of trips to Italy with the kids, and I, I'm trying to spend more time in Europe. And and we we're just doing. I'm I'm taking time for my family because I neglected a lot when they were younger. I missed a lot of birthdays, a lot of dance recitals, a lot of t-ball. I missed a lot of that. I'm trying to. Trying to spend more time slowing the pace down a little bit. I, and, I, and I really don't want to run that hard like I used to. Isn't traveling odd in that we grew up very similarly? You didn't go out of the state, much less no. out of the country. I was always scared to death by what I'd see on TV. Oh, yeah. And now that I've gotten older and have had a pretty successful career, I've gone to a few places. And it is, like, bizarre and amazing. But I was never in that let's travel, have vacations culture, which I am now. And, like, I'm kind of jealous I didn't get to do it, but I'm also, like, a 12-year-old when I go places now. Where I'm like, this is great. Like, we went to Italy. I was like, I can't believe I'm in another country. I love it. Isn't it, isn't it wild? It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And I, only, I thought it was like, that's, like, places you go in movies. But, like, traveling is weird, and people are awesome. People are awesome everywhere. You, you get what you give. That's true. If, if you're gracious and you don't, if you bring your American ideology with you oh, and boy. you're really... Loud. and loud yeah. and obnoxious. You're, you're off-putting to people. Yeah. And so I try to teach my kids when we travel to be very gracious and respect and appreciate other cultures. Uh, you know, you might not like it, but at least try it. Try the food. Try the cuisine. Be nice to people. And, and it comes back to you. Will you tell me the, the Bluebird story? You're playing in the Bluebird and you get seen by somebody cool? No, no. That, it wasn't the Bluebird? So, it was. The Bluebird is in the mix, but that's so misconstrued. When I first got to town, 
I started doing every every little music all, uh, competition that I could do. All the little clubs had little jams and stuff where you could get up, and I'd win a hundred bucks here and there. Well, I met some people and wound up over in Kentucky at a thing called Live at Libby's, which uh, was a, uh, st- a supper club, kind of a Opry style music hall that broadcast every Saturday night back from Kentucky into Nashville. And so they would have their first hour where you would do a couple of songs with the house band and then they had their headliner and they had a George Jones impersonator and a Johnny Cash impersonator, you know the deal. Well, I'd started performing on that show in December of 90 when I got to town, I got down to September. And some folks had come over from uh, Atlantic, some management guys with some executives from Atlantic Records that came to see somebody else on that show. And they liked me better. And in January, we I wound up hooking up with these guys. They became my managers. I did a showcase at the Bluebird in January. Rick Blackburn from Atlantic agreed to sign me in January. I got hooked up with James Stroud. In May of 91, we cut sticks and stones. So it all happened oh, in about a seven-month window. It was very fast for me. That would have happened so fast. And looking back, it was wonderful. But I wouldn't have trusted it. It would happen so fast. I'd have been like, there's no way this can be real. It was, it was, I've never heard of it happening faster for anybody because I didn't know anybody when I got there. I never knocked on a door. I didn't go to labels. I didn't pitch a demo. I never did any of that stuff. And I guess probably to you, it was just normal because it's all you knew. It you didn't really happened. know. Yeah. You know, I'd always believed that I was destiny you know it's like it was supposed to happen mm-hmm. i really believed it was i just kind of went with it what's up with the podcast podcast is doing great uh uh i've had to take a couple of months off because i was touring so heavy but we're getting back in the groove with it right now what uh what's the name of it uh tl's roadhouse t-o t-l T-L. wait no wait t-l's t-l's that's what i thought i thought you said t-o's it was like no different t-l's terrell owens yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's at, it's at twang yeah yeah t-l's roadhouse so t-l's roadhouse you guys can search that and what do you what do you do on on the podcast like you know it, it's basically i've i've had a lot of tiktokers i've had a few actors some comedians a lot of younger artists in the business and my whole premise is really just to find the common ground that we share you know even though we all are are very passionate we have a lot of the same likes but there's a lot of difference between all of us and every journey is different for everybody that comes to town we all take a different path so it's just it's just a conversation about trying to find the things that we have in common and the things that make us different but but uh, it's it's been very good. It's been very entertaining for me. I enjoy I enjoy talking to new people. Where do you record it? I've been doing it in the front lounge of my bus. That's cool. And I've done some. I've of seen them the on videos. The road. I've, so seen, I've done yeah. some of it on the road, but it, it's easier when I, I have a bus pad where I park all my coaches and all my stuff there at the house. So it's easier when I can set everything up and do two days at a time, and I'll do four or five artists in two days because I have to pack everything back up. When we do a podcast, I have to set everything up every time. You enjoy that? I do. That's cool. I like it a lot. Cool. Make any money on that yet? No. <laughs> Not we, we, we did talk, Tracy. We yeah. did talk, yeah. Um, so check out the podcast. The music's been out for a month or so. And then TracyLawrence.com and go watch Tracy do a show. Please. Yeah, Tracy's awesome. Yeah. Um, okay. Are you a Razorback fan? I am. Yeah. Baseball season was hard this yeah. year. Yeah. I know you. I'm just setting it up here. I'm also a massive Razorback fan. Baseball, oh, that sucked. It was terrible. It's, all, it's been a rough year. It's, it's all the way around. It's rough all the way around. So I have a few friends that are Razorback fans. Um, and so I have this helmet here, and I'm going to have a bunch of us Razorbackers sign this helmet. Cool. And then I'm going to auction off for NIL so we can have better players. Okay. So we just, we just sign it. We're done here. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Because we're going to pay for better players legally. <laughs> it's worth it. And then we will, yes, that's right. Uh, Tracy, really appreciate you. You guys go to Tracy's Instagram, the real Tracy Lawrence. Do not follow the fake Tracy Lawrence. <laughs> There's a bunch of them. He, or even at the fake Tracy Lawrence. Yeah. That's a fraud. Uh, the new EP is out. It's called Out Here In It. And check out the podcast and go watch Tracy Live, tracylawrence.com. Tracy, as a person, I'm a fan. And as a fan, I'm a fan. Thank you, my yeah, friend. Yeah, yeah, there he is. Tracy Lawrence, everybody. Nice Woo. job. Thank you much.